that Eric get proper sleep after this? Because <laughs> he woke up really early, jet lagged, kind of semi quarantining between one yeah. travel and the other. Yeah. So you're displaced. <laughs> yeah. Now it's a pleasure to be connecting with you guys in Berlin and and to feel the the heat. Like it, it's great to have um, a milieu information and and to see it grow over the months and over the years. Like Eugenio, we've met like what two years ago now. No. And our different quests and trajectories. So now it's really a pleasure. Thanks for putting it up uh, in such a short time. I had no idea what to present about at the beginning, so I sent you an abstract of stuff that I had just finished working on. But listening to Christine and then to Wasim, I thought, I think I have something to offer today that is, I think, a, a really good match that is articulating both the, the issues around storytelling that Christine was uh, tackling at the beginning and uh, Wasim's uh, kind of a crypto trader uh, confession, you know, of the, the, <laughs> the reversal of trajectories, which I, I really appreciate. I think it's a great way also to, to share knowledge, to, to make it dynamic in this way. And no, I, I truly appreciated it. So that's listening to you that I decided to change uh, topic. So instead of talking about mutual encryption, which is like more a specific way of, let's say, to be very graphic, uh, a way to articulate the divide between the Black Panthers and the techno utopian that were just on the other side of the of the Bay Area. So the the, the birth of the world we're in, you know, between the the, the, the hippie techno utopist uh, of San Francisco and then the Black Panthers that were somehow defending or developing protocols for self defense in a world that was deeply toxic uh, and and still is. And, and the quote that you decided to uh, bring in uh, next to the solar punk uh, discussion from Bio is, uh, for me, uh, extremely telling. So I think I'm going to pick up from there. I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to yeah, read. Please do. And, and yeah, I'm going to comment the quote rapidly and then move on with, uh, with my talk uh, proper. I'm going to try to read, but this, you will see what seems like the, 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 the echoes are so close that, like, now we're going to be discussing what risk, risk assessment management and stuff uh, at the next salon. And I think we have maybe a good basis here to, to iterate further. So let me see. Uh, yeah, here it is. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we do. Okay, great. So um, like a tropical storm, I too may one day become better organized is what I'm going to be uh, discussing. But before, before going into that, I just wanted to comment uh, rapidly uh, Bio's quote, um, the first paragraph of it. This idea, because I mean, the, the idea of place and, and sharing and, and bodies in relation, I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely important. It's been discussed a lot. I like the twist that he brings in when he says, to be in a place is to keep making maps to locate oneself there again and again. I like that recursive mapping function that is, I think, very rigorous when it comes to what is it to generate localities that are not predicated on uh, historical identities, you know, like people in the most regressive sense, but something that includes in its definition of placemaking a mapping function I think uh, can open up uh, quite what something that I like to call uh, following a couple of friends here in Montreal um, uh, techniques for becoming uh, belonging in becoming. So this idea of being at home as always being an exercise in cartography, I think I think it's it's very strong. It's, it's very rich. And this is basically what I'm going to be articulating through another uh, entry point, which is a little story by Lydia Davis. Uh, called, well, here's the story, and, and here's the presentation of that story. So, like a tropical storm, I too may one day become better organized. This sentence is not extracted from a longer text. It is not an excerpt, nor a quote. It is a story in and of itself, a little literary machine, indeed exhaustive and complete, a plot generator in its own right. It appears in the varieties of disturbance section of the collected stories of Lydia Davis. 
with the remarkable economy of means, Lydia Davis system sentence succeeds in establishing a zone of recursive intelligibility, a refrain, a tune of its own, a climate. Derived from the ancient Greek klima, the word was originally applied in geography. It designates a position defined by the inclination of the sky or the stars, as well as a terrestrial region viewed in terms of the temperature that prevails there. It took only a small step from here to end up with today's usage of the word climate to, to describe an effective atmosphere, the ambience that permeates a place, for example, a climate of insecurity, or as Auguste Comte emphatically stated in his positive philosophy, the social influence of permanent local causes, which I guess is realist enough uh, in, in what seems a uh, sense. This climatic organizing of atmospheric forces offers an interesting counterpoint to the constant process of contingentization and formal integration to the functional unification of the world under the aegis of capital. For if our main challenge nowadays is about ecologizing value, if the idea is to counteract the world system of the economy and to deactivate it or make it inoperative, or again, to exfoliate the modes of capture and organization that are proper to it, I believe that we will have to arm ourselves with thought images that can help us escape this regime which seizes everything from the outside, this mode of existence for which each abstraction results in an extractive procedure. And that's part of the discussion we've had with Wasim, like um, what type of knowledge do we generate when we come uh, as a dis transdisciplinary collective? And, 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 and it's, it's, a, it's a fairly deep question because it takes time for each other to assess our different trajectories and, and, and the disciplines that we can't just pretend we know right from the start. And at the same time, at some point, we need to be somehow able to build bridges between them. So I, I really appreciated this, this attempt by Wasim at, at uh, simulating some epistemic trespassing uh, attempts. I, I, for my part, that's part of our discussion, would go more for like something more about uh, transductive processes. But here I think we have the components of what we want to work around, which in my terms here would be the exfoliation of the value form, which you did already discussing the way Bitcoin conceives of itself as a, a black hole of money. So it's, I guess it's the realism of that irresistible black hole that, um, that requires perhaps some uh, heavy loaded ontological tools uh, to, to debunk somehow, because otherwise it's really, I think at this level of, of the discussion, it's a problem of uh, images of thought. Like what do we deem real enough and how do we propel into existence uh, uh, realities that might be a bit too fragile uh, as of now. So in The Life of Plants, A Metaphysics of Mixture, Emanuele Cocha lays out an ontology that is in tune with the breath of life forms, a great cosmology of mixture that puts a special emphasis on the notion of climate. The climate, he writes, is the name and the metaphysical structure of mixture. He goes on saying, climate is the being of cosmic unity. In all climates, the relation between the container and the contained is constantly reversible. What is place becomes content, what is content becomes place. The medium becomes subject and the subject becomes medium. All climate presupposes this constant topological inversion, this oscillation that undoes the border between subject and environment, a role reversing oscillation. So Kocha offers numerous resources for a general conjuration of the value form and its procedures of exclusion, enclosure, and formalization. Its taste for the clear and distinct, its obsession for the clean and proper. This conjuration involves, among other things, a thorough criticism of the epistemological ideal of knowledge specialization, or more precisely, of specialization as a corporatist expression of the organization of knowledge. So I quote Kocha again, universitas is the technical term that names a corporation 
and in the cognitive limits of the discipline are those of the um, sorry the cognitive limits of the discipline are those of the self awareness of the corporation the identity the reality the unity and the epistemological autonomy of the discipline in question are no more than secondary effects of the distinction unity and power of the collegium association of the learned persons who governed it so you will see where I'm going here, because that's really the question of the incorporation of value that I'm interested in here, and how can we work our way around it. Such consideration to undo the institutional borders of knowledge, invert topologies, seize atmospheres by their milieu, and derive new cosmogonies from them, have become urgent among a growing number of people. Emanuele Cocha, like the authors of The Undercommons, or the duo behind the film essay, Deep Implicancy, helps us to visualize the decrease of value, to expose the lethal charge carried by the abstraction inherited from metaphysics and the material and exceptionalizing determinations that are associated with it. So I, I, I can only recommend uh, watching um, Denise Ferreira da Silva and Arjun Newman's film, Four Waters, Deep Implicancy, as like an applied attempt, a filmic uh, attempt at uh, folding oneself into the fabric of the world in ways that will revert uh, or, or, or topologically revert the value form as, as a technique of enclosure. So these ideas inevitably uh, contrast with the enabling constraints or constituent powers at work in the field of cryptoeconomics. Armed with its blockchain and other distributed ledger technologies, cryptoeconomics lives off the promise that we could turn the economy into a design question, that we could program its governing categories in, other way, in another way, beginning with the operation of its value accumulators to partially short-circuiting its state and legal foundations. So the question of the value accumulation is really key here for whatever scalable economical system we're envisaging uh, in some post-capitalist uh, or solar punk future. It is a movement in which libertarians and cypherpunks rallied, rallied around the slogan, cold is law, mingled with generally well-intentioned young people who may have accepted a bit too literally the possibility evoked by Thomas Piketty of attacking the systemic inequalities, not by abolishing them, but by establishing new forms of property, social, fractal, speculative, but also temporary and, of course, decentralized. Fire, walk with me. On the sorcery of the spectacle Reddit thread, one encounters a representative description of the jar of abrasive realism that prompts one to redefine from within the system the modes of capture of capital. So I quote from this, uh, these are these are people that collaborated with the Economic Space Agency a couple of years ago and with Holochain as well. So they, 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 they wrote, capitalism only hangs on because it is the most secure way of securing value inside a container. So whatever comes after capitalism would simply be more of that. The only thing that can defeat capitalism is an even more secure way of securing value inside a container that is even more capitalist. So this is like written by young sorcerers of the spectacles that are deeply influenced by uh, someone like Nickland, for instance, um, and the type of uh, accelerationism that you can feel here, like we need better containers if we want to challenge the way wealth is distributed nowadays. I mean, this is like a textbook description of what Bitcoin is about. So that really ties in closely with uh, what we were saying before, uh, Bitcoin can't care uh, less about what is external to its network. And that's the formal beauty of it, I guess. That's what Nick Land celebrates in his uh, uh, to be published book uh, about, about Bitcoin, like this self-enclosed, uh, like self-enclosed self-sufficiency uh, has as a, a, a formal beauty to itself and it's economically extremely powerful. But I agree that uh, to generate such black hole is indeed, we're paying too much for that. Uh, so I, I would say that Bitcoin is like the wet dream of a certain way of um, 
conceiving economics as a self-enclosed system that is able to abstract itself in such ways that anything that doesn't concern economics becomes what we call externalities, which I mean, this is, this is uh, deeply, deeply offensive. This is the worst, this is the most toxic part, I guess, of the whole Western metaphysics. Because it produces so much toxicity, produces so much rest, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, I guess it's, it's our challenge to deal with that. So what is at play here from a crypto financial point of view is the process of incorporation of forms of value as such. That is the legal or digital codification whereby an economic asset is enclosed, securitized, monetized, that is contingentialized. An economy founded on a blockchain makes it possible to issue tokens in which various governance and property rights, various pre-established circulation and transmission rules would be programmed, a new form of network-based value. These techno-social formations or legal and digital incorporations constitute what the economic space agency calls economic spaces, meaning spaces within which it is the very organization of our way of risking and speculating together that becomes the main vector of valorization. So that's as far as I will go in the crypto economic side of things. Uh, I think it's clear enough that we have a challenge here that is about, uh, I think personally, we can't fight uh, capitalism or whatever value form uh, enclosure devices that we're dealing with without generating our own way of partially enclosing value, uh, which is, I guess, uh, what I would call here a, a pharmacological approach. There are different ways of doing it. Uh, not everyone needs to go on that uh, uh, front line, but I think that's kind of what brought us together in Berlin to try to think at this, uh, at, yeah, at, at this very conjuncture. So it's, it's, we are creating a climate somehow around trust and, and a few other localities. And, it, and it's pretty powerful. So it is this tension between the necessary operational enclosures of the value form and the deep compartmentalizations inspired by climate-oriented approach that I feel one must fully envisage here. At best, cryptoeconomics and its digital incorporation of forms of value could act as an egentropic pharmacon, as Bernard Stiglitz puts it a perspective in which the economy itself works as a general therapy for the biosphere, reversing the destructive course of the Anthropocene by favoring the always localized slowing down of entropic processes. At worst, and I mean, for now, we're clearly more on the worst side of things, the proliferation of crypto-economics modes of organization might actually signify the destruction that is the economic reduction of countless other types of world and practices, more subtle, more improbable, less calculable to. The quest for scalability, and that thing reminds us, tends to banish meaningful diversity, that is diversity that might make a difference. Indeed, just as more traditional capitalist formations, crypto-economically enabled modes of governance might be predating upon forms of trans-individual sociality that have been as Fred Moten and Stefano Harney have explained in the undercommons, militantly preserved away from for-profit capitalist computability. And this is where the discrete charm of Lydia Davis' literary proposition displays its effectiveness, in my view. It suggests for the blockchain and distributed autonomous organizations enthusiasts, as much as for the most hardened among those who have professed allegiance to critique as a mode of existence, that perhaps one day we also may become better organized. Like a tropical storm, the image of the tropical storm as paradigm of an organization to come is immediately seductive. All of the Anthropocene seems to be contained here in a single and desirable momentum, an incoactive movement proportionate to the devastating powers of these quasi-chaotic and self-organized systems we call hurricanes. But things get more complicated as of the next line. I, too, may one day become better organized. The I set apart by a comma, reflected and differentiated via the conjunctive adverb to, considers the eventuality of an improvement. This upcoming optimization, this possibility of a becoming better organized, is introduced by quotation marks that immediately leave one perplexed and retrospectively questioning what modification do they convey 
What mundane element do they partake in? In other words, what do they testify to and socially verify? Talk about the commas here. When we bring commas or square quotes, it's, it's, it's a very social act that we are um, bringing in because we're implying uh, some sort of reference. These commas seem to indicate a relative complicity, maybe with anonymous materials, hinting at some double entendre, something that, however understated or underdetermined it is, is likely to be discovered and referenced, discoverable because referenced, and that may, for this very reason, be shared too. For my part, I cannot help but see at least a tinge of ironic distancing at work here, or perhaps even slightly verging on the side of the organizational paranoia, a straight up warning regarding best practices. These allegedly optimal ways of doing and behaving for the always professionalizing subject of the startup world, self-upgrading codes of conduct at the core of the managerial mystique upheld by the standing reserves of consultants. Better organized, the uncanniness that these quotation marks introduce is consistent with the promise of standardization that lurks within this expression. The I too is end sport subjected to potential optimizing conformation, which is perhaps not a bad thing as such, but nowadays it would however be prudent, prudent to keep one's guards up when someone makes you such an offer. It is often not quite custom made, at times even just plain random, most likely to make you learn to make you lean or agile, thereby pursuing the leveling work of generalized governance. Stefano Harney shows how much the fallow land between a life and its organizational formatting can rapidly be transformed into an opportunity for extending the realm of capital's elig uh, eligibility. <laughs> so I'm quoting Stefano Harney here. This immersion in the market is doubled in the figure of the consultant. The consultant is nothing more than a demonstration of access. He or she can show up in your workplace and open it up in ways you thought were protected, solid. His presence is proof that you are now newly accessible. No one needs to listen to a consultant. He is just a talking algorithm anyway, but he has made his point by showing up. So here there would be like a, a tangent towards techniques for mutual encryption, or like how do you deal with a consultant coming to your workplace? Or how do we deal with ourselves as uh, constantly threatened by becoming consultants? That would be the more intimate version of it. So better organized, isolated between scare quotes, as they are delightfully called in English, the syntagm introduces a slight inter interactional lag, an ex existential singularization that causes or will cause a steer. The estrangement embodied in the idea of a life in the process of being formed, of being informed, stages something like a contingent plot information to become or not to become better organized. From this perspective, the brief sentence reveals itself to be both a territorializing recursion and an adventure in singularization. So this last part is maybe a little bit more uh, far-fetched, not far-fetched, but just, just a bit more abstract, so bear with me. I'm, I'm trying to name something about, and that's where I'm uh, going towards uh, what seem uh, background, to, to, to put it in, in, in very um, uh, graphic terms, because I am learning, like, like you see this type of presentation, very literary, very uh, continental perhaps. And, and there is a real joy in appreciating um, uh, more and more, um, uh, more and more discrete forms of uh, knowledge production. And, and Gattari has a very nice way to, to bridge uh, uh, these two worlds, like between soft and hard sciences or, or whatever we call them. So he says, what is affirmed during this traversing of regions of being and modes of semiotization are traits of singularization, kinds of existential stamps that date, eventualize, contingialize states of fact, the referential correlates and the assemblages of enunciation that corresponds to them. 
Another way he puts it, I know here, like it may be not super proper in a talk like that, it's, it's, it's quite abstract, but he says, like to, to say the same thing from another perspective, he says, flows only subsist if supported by the modulation of an imminent point of view that finitizes or contingences their determinability. So you have like a philosopher that has been writing books with Deleuze that are all about flows, here going in the detail of what flows are made of, and this is exactly, I think, the challenge of dealing with cryptoeconomics and dealing with the actual making of the economic flows as we know them and see if we can divert, hack, I don't know. We need to tackle the challenge of seeing how things have, have been discretized, how value or, or forms of value have been um, enclosed in order to perhaps uh, do something else with them. So it's kind of like, for me, the image is, is a bit of... Um, um, like the the uranium, enriched uranium as a, a toxic waste, it's there. Like it's going to be there for a long time. We need to learn to evolve or bring it closer to our gravity center or we need to play with it. Like the, the question of value is, is pretty deep uh, because we all profoundly, I guess, and I guess maybe that's a question for the solar punk that we were discussing before, how much civilization do we want to carry forth? Like how much continuity, historical continuity do we want to inscribe ourselves in? And, and whatever answer we, we bring to that question involves the, the notion of value. So maybe to wrap up, uh, Felix Gattari's schizoanalytic cartographies are fascinating for those who seek to, to think the value form and the means of its pharmacological exfoliation with or without blockchain. One indeed cannot envisage to ecologize or deactivate value without making oneself more sensitive to the existential stamps or what I would call here the temporal signatures of finance. Famili uh, familiarizing oneself with finance contingentialization power and future bound activation to its value discovery process and the way in which it takes a hold on the to come of forms of life is, I think, the, 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 the challenge here. So basically, um, like a tropical storm, we need to accept the capture of a becoming climate and stay with the financial trouble. So that, that will be it uh, for me now. Let me stop the sharing. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Cool. Okay, let's go back to the gallery. Yeah. There you go. Wow, Eric. It's always a journey to let, sit back and listen to your yeah, your mind speaking. Um, and uh, yeah, also nice to hear again some reference, uh, like deep implicacy. Do you mind uh, explore that a little bit? Yeah, it's a film that was made by Arjun Newman and Denise Ferreira da Silva. It was presented at the Berlin Biennale in 2018. It's online. I, I, I can send you the link. You can find it pretty easily on mm -hmm. Vimeo. It's about half an hour long, and it's uh, it's basically uh, a visual manifesto against the geometrization of value. So it's going back to the sources of, of Plato and, and uh, Western philosophy, and then tries to suggest other modes of uh, immersing oneself in what Denise calls the plenum. Uh, I have my reservation with uh, Denise's way of talking about the plenum, um, but for that matter, like, I think that the title is extremely um, suggestive, like modes of deep implicancy brings you on a different path than producing uh, self-enclosed forms of value that can then circulate um, uh, insensible, uh, insensitive or, 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 or uh, undifferentiating uh, themselves from anything else. Cool. That's, that's the violence that is... Uh, encapsulated in, in, in the value form 
that Denise is and, and Arjun are criticizing through this idea of deep implicacy. But it, it's 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 a trippy film. Like I mean, it's it's a it's a deeply uh, immediating uh, film that I, I strongly recommend. So uh, Eric, if I may be so bold, um, we have a secret celebrity questioner has been watching our talk in a crypto castle in France. And they have been sending questions for you. They would like to talk to you. They're interested by the content of your uh, discussions. And so there's a question here about extitutions as opposed to institutions. Okay. Um, and I suppose this might be, you know, like uh, the Lacanian extimacy in relation to intimacy. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the question is asking about the extent to which your talk relates to extitutional theory and where we can design exclosures in order to protect against enclosures. And the example that this person has given is a copyleft, as in Creative Commons, uh, is an enclosure from copyright to protect commons. Mm -hmm. And so what's the equivalent for blockchains or like in crypto economics? Yeah, I don't know what's the equivalent exactly, but we're working on one uh, with uh, the project, uh, the Sphere, that I'm part of, uh, trying to create some sort of uh, digital commons for the performing arts. And, and circus artists. Um, I mean, I think I, there's no, there's no, it's practical. I think like the the passage between the, the in and the X. Um, I, I I do think there is a part uh, of. Um, I mean, you can call it different ways: uh, self-organizing, uh, taking up some sense of locality. What is it that you want to defend, or what is it that you are? actually always already expressing that needs to be taken up uh, at a formal level so that something can be because I, I come from a, a a background where it's it's very much about experiencing the impersonal flow of affects and then some individuals will coalesce into an expression you know it's like there's a lot that you can describe by uh, de invent uh, de uh, individuating and, and trying to be more uh, sensitive to the forces around, but when I started engaging with crypto economics, it was more in the financial activist type of mindset, and and that requires taking up the question of how to formalize things so that um, they can interact at a level that will be I don't know politically significant. How so did that thought on the activist um, milieu? Uh, what about uh, co-option? as a, a, a way of like thinking about exclusion and enclosures. So maybe we're trying to build, build economic and technological primitives that mitigate against co appropriation and co-option. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good point. Um, I mean, within the digital world as we know it, I think we need uh, less, um, I, I, maybe I'm too blunt here, but there's a lot of discussions in the DAO space about modes of governance that are constantly reiterating a, 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 a fairly straightforward ideal of transparency. Like we want more transparency, we want more democracy, we want more decentralization. And, and maybe a bit provocatively here and, and, and building on what you were just suggesting, when you build up some sort of digital fortress <laughs> for, for whatever reason, you might want to consider a secret society as a cultural technique, you know, as as, as something that might speak to you more directly than inventing modes of voting that will be even more democratic. Than, I mean, you need voting, you need quadratic voting, you need all sorts of transparency for scalable organization to take hold, but that's not the end of the story. You, you also need in the same breath to consider um, hyperstitional elements that are always part of any um, uh, process of governance. Mm. It doesn't matter what the technological substrate is, it's uh, people at other, other side, uh, both sides in most cases. I mean, it's social machines all through, you know, like, like the people are actually also technologically individuated, I would say. Like, it, it matters who picks up what, you know, like, what type of weapon do you pick up as you flee or as you want to build this new um, stronghold or, or, or just fugitive uh, lines of flight. But uh, yeah, and just, just not to have this opposition between the technique or the infrastructural and the people, because 
I think I think we agree on how this is actually <laughs> a very like you you tell stories about Bitcoin that very few people can tell because you know how the technical infrastructure and the people entertaining it are at some point uh, weaved in. And, and, and this is very rich to be able to de describe it at that level. The implications of the implications. Yep. <laughs> the deep so implications of Bitcoin. I have actually more questions from our uh, secret superstar viewer. But if I ask them, I worry that it will identify the person. So I will not ask them. We'll talk about them offline. Okay. Come on. <laughs> Just say, okay, well, here's one I can ask about DAOs. So we already spoke about DAOs and we have friends, very close friends that work very uh, deeply with them. Uh, this idea of an inside out organization that doesn't have any leaders like a P2P structure. Can and how is a DAO an institution as opposed to an institution? Uh, can you can you say again, sorry? Sure. Uh, how How is a DAO an institution as opposed to an institution? But I, I don't know. I, I've never thought of institution in that way. I, I understand. I mean, I, what I'm suggesting here is more. Um, let's be climatic about it. Uh, like let's let's allow for all the forces that constitute a climate as a locality, as a, precar a precarious locality, to somehow uh, factor in. Um, I, I am like institution is, is a really problematic word. In French, we have instauration. Instauration, you can translate it by establishing, but instauration gives you a better sense that when you institute something into existence, when you organize a kernel that will have some sort of historical life, um, you are actually, it's like, it's like, you know, when you write a piece or you, you do something creative you know when that thing will be able to walk by itself in the world. But before that, it's on you to nurture the soul that you're constituting, you know? That is what instauration is about. What type of institutions are we building together with our uh, open-ended conversation? I don't know exactly, but the way we pick up the consequences of the thinking we're doing together is uh, instaurative. It has, it has a power that could start expressing itself in, in, in context and milieus that we don't even uh, uh, see uh, for now. Right. Yeah, <laughs> I would say I'm rather happy to have spent the day with you all. Um, Likewise. Yeah. So we signing off? Yeah, I mean, uh, unless you guys want to continue. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm good. We'll continue. Uh, I'm going to say already. Yeah. And there is live deprived. And I guess you both too, in a way. So it's really nice to see you, Eric, and yourself, Christine, as well. And uh, hopefully we can uh, reconnect uh, during the rest of the program. Yeah, Christine, really a pleasure. And, and, and Eugenio, Wasim, always a pleasure. Always a pleasure with all Thank of you. you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. I guess we're saying goodbye. Thank Thanks, you. Everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.